The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This episode is brought to you by Capital Group, one of the oldest and largest asset management companies in the world, managing multi-asset, equity and fixed income investment strategies for different types of investors. Since 1931, Capital Group has been singularly focused on delivering superior, consistent results for long-term investors using high conviction portfolios, rigorous research and individual accountability. Okay, welcome back to the podcast. I'm James Wrigley today, I've got the pleasure of speaking with Chris Carlin from Master Your Money Now. Now, some of you listening may have seen Chris has put up a post in the Ensemble uh, forum thing there, the chat, uh, asking for some questions for today's podcast, which is fantastic. So, we're going to get stuck into those. But Chris, thank you for joining me. Pleasure to be speaking with you again. Well, it's a pleasure to speak to you, Mr. TikTok superstar, James Wrigley. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Yeah, no, thank you for the opportunity to, I guess, uh, share what's been a Interesting uh, 12 months, that's for sure. I'm sure we'll dig into that. And uh, yeah, very glad to hear that uh, a lot of people are interested, and I guess, struggling with the uh, same issues that I've been struggling with over the last 12 months. So glad to be able to give back to uh, the financial planning community that's been so good to me. Yeah. So, so, you've, so you've just recently sold your business, which, we'll, which we're going to jump to very quickly. But, but before we do, maybe just briefly on master your money now, what that, you know, what that business is, was, who you worked with, just a, a brief one there and then we'll get into the, the main part of today's podcast. Yeah, so Master Your Money Now founded uh, in July 2018 uh, with a real emphasis on looking after millennial nurses and teachers with their finances. Uh, based in Geelong, but we had uh, clients Australia-wide, uh, we, were using, uh, we were using Zoom before COVID made it famous. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just you know, helping everyday millennials with their with what was really important to them. So buying their first home, protecting their loved ones, getting started invested, you know, investing so they can retire earlier and with more. And uh, by the time uh, at the moment, we've got about 130, 140 ongoing members and uh, a team of five, which transitioned across to uh, to now uh, Vista Financial Group. Yeah, nice. So quite a business that you. So what, five years or so? You would you're doing it on your own? Yeah, just about five years. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Nice. So, so you mentioned Vista just there. So you've you've recently sold your business. Yep. Can you talk us through like what what transpired to 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 make you get to that point where you decided you it was time to sell? Yeah. So and you know, we're recording this in uh, May 2023. And if you told me 12 months ago this is be the position that I was in, uh, I would have said that you were absolutely crazy. Um, but it's been an interesting uh, 12 months. Um, been, it was a couple of key events happened. Um, firstly, I was uh, 28th of June, 2022. I was almost killed in a car crash, um, just driving down a house, driving down a road near my house or driven down a thousand times before. And then a car Completely ignored a stop sign, had to be going twice the limit, cleaned straight through my fronts and um, and kept going. And half a second later, I was able to walk away from it, but half a second later would have hit my driver's side door and uh, I would have met my uh, second daughter, Chelsea, who was born six weeks later. So um, something like that really messes with you. Uh, yeah. it's, it really makes you think of, uh, I guess, yeah, your mortality and uh, what's actually really important to you. So uh, um and kind of, I guess, kind of brought on a, a semi mid uh, midlife crisis. Uh, I'm only 34, so hopefully it's come a little bit early. But uh, yeah, really made me reassess. Well, what's important and what's not. Um, on that as well, uh, Chelsea was born uh, six weeks later. That she's my second daughter. My oldest, Charlotte, is uh, turned two. Um, so going from uh, one to two for certainly for me and my family is a massive step up. Zero to one was easy, easier, but. Yes, as the male, uh, and I know you got kids, James. It's uh, 
it's easier for the male when there's only one, but uh, when there's two and the numbers are even, then uh, it's, uh, yeah, that was a real challenge for us and um, uh, as a family. So, and yeah, in terms of where the business was at, we were in a good position. We're kind of caught between that, uh, I guess that black hole, for lack of a better word, between a sole person operator and then being able to really expand to that, uh, you know, multi-advisor office, uh, things like that. But I just got to the end of the year and I was, I don't want to make it sound like I was like overplayed by saying oh, I was depressed and things like that. But I was definitely, um, I was definitely feeling it mentally. I was yeah. definitely very tired. Uh, and I think I just ran out of ideas. And a lot of the things that we set out to do, being an online advisor for millennial nurses, um, uh, what, what's, what were you know, unique ideas five years ago were now below minimum standard or others had moved into that space as well, social media, being online and things like that. So I just realized I got to the point that I either needed to keep growing the business or um, to get out where we were in, or if I just stayed sideways, there was no real benefit to myself, my team, my members, my family if we just went sideways for a few years as uh, we went through... Uh, um, I guess the young family phase. And so, and I didn't want to be an absent dad. I didn't want to be standing 60 hours a week and have been a burden in that front on my family as well. So we just got to December. I just said to my wife, look, I, um, I think I'm done. Um, I think it's now time to pass this on to someone else. And, uh, she was very quick to say yes to that. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, I can definitely say, yeah, the, um, uh, yeah, there's just, I was just juggling too many balls, James, and I knew, and I'm sure you've seen as well, and everyone listening to this has seen it, we've seen other financial planners who've uh, sadly held on a little bit too long whilst uh, going through tough times, especially solar operators, and it's and it's a terrible outcome for yeah. members and and, for, and for their, the financial planners' families and everyone else. So I didn't want to be like that. Uh, um, I knew my limits. I knew I'd been exceeding my limits. I knew I just couldn't. I just couldn't grow it anymore. And so I was just, it was time to give it to someone else who had the time, the resources, the energy to uh, take Masty Money now to the next level and ultimately make it better. So, um, yeah, that was that was the process to get to where we are. And, um, and yeah, that's, uh, and things are good. So, the like, the, the you know, you're talking about the, you're stuck in that black hole of being a single operator to do you take on other advisors or and try and try and grow it. Did you? Did you give any thought whilst you were going through that process to taking on a business partner of sorts, or or it was you 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 were set on passing over the whole business to someone else? Yeah, so I think there does need to be one boss, one CEO. Yeah, and so uh, yeah, I didn't want to. I don't think a business partner was the right move for me. Yeah. Um, and also, I guess the other part as well. When we set out the intention in December to. Uh, sell the business um it was with the intention that uh we'll see out the year in australia but uh but then move back to new zealand uh to be closer to my wife's family and uh to get that much needed family support um and so obviously you know while i'm in new zealand uh i i can't be an advisor so that one wasn't an option for me or at least as an advisor i could have done a non-advisor role but uh, yeah, that wasn't a, an option for me. So look, considered it, um, but uh, at that stage, no, I didn't think it was the, the right move for me personally. Gotcha. gotcha. So, so are you in New Zealand now or are you thinking of going at the end of the year? What, what's the, that New Zealand comment? Yeah, so um, uh, yeah, the intention was when we put it on that, yeah, we're going to move to New Zealand 2024. I'm still in Geelong at the moment, but uh, we actually gotcha. yep. a, um, I actually spent a month in New Zealand in March um uh, which was after we, uh, not we we were in exclusive negotiations with Tyson at that point, um, and just going through the legal process. But we spent a month in New Zealand, and it was actually like, uh, this is economically New Zealand is in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, right. And we just realised we could not be here as much as we want to be in your family when you can't feed a family of four hundred five hundred bucks a week. Uh, nurses are paid about 50% less than what they are in Australia. 10% of all nurses have left New Zealand to come to Australia in the last six months. Yeah. Um, I would, I, there's no financial planning roles I could see above 80 grand. Uh, and yet property prices are higher and interest rates are in the sevens and eights as we're speaking. So 
it was just not going to work. So we did the month there and went, oh, no, we're not going to go to Australia. Sorry, we're not going to move to New Zealand. We're crossing yeah. that out. So, yeah. So, um, fully had to go back with Tyson on that one. And thankfully, he said, well, look, I'd really be open to um, staying on. So, we're, we're certainly discussing that. Uh, that and uh, I guess, yeah, taking the time to figure out what my next steps is going to be uh, and give myself time to figure out what next steps are going to be and go from there. So, so maybe talk us through the sale itself. So, you know, how do you sell a financial planning business? Like, you know, I work in a business, as you said, with with multiple partners. So, so you know, I'm as far away from being a, a solo practitioner as you can possibly be. How do you do it? Where do you even start? And what does the process look like? Yeah, so I I did mine through a broker. Um, I went, I actually received an email from Growth focus i think like most financial planners i want a couple of um different news uh email newsletters were businesses for sale i was actually looking at a small business for sale actually that they had and um called them up and they said at the time it was sold I was like okay fair enough um well while i've got you um this is this is my numbers this is what i'm thinking what do you think is worth and i had an idea what it was worth in my head and that uh which was i said that was realistic if if anything, was slightly under or was slightly under in the end. Um, and so, like, here's the process, away you go. So once I um, uh, once I said, once I had the chat to the wife and um, and felt, yep, this was the, the right thing to do, I decided that um, uh, selling was, uh, yeah, we went through the, bro- the process and the broker went through that. So, yeah, went through, um, yeah, like I said, uh, growth focus, uh, Stephen Fine, Matt Sweeney, pretty much took care of the whole process, which is great. So firstly, it was getting all the data ready, um, uh, you know, going through your clients, making sure what your spreadsheets that we've all got matches uh, what's um, uh, what's actually on the on the revenue reports, things like that. So that was a very much an administration process to put together the um, the memorandum for the business. Yep. And, the, and then that memorandum and uh, I guess the for sale sign was put on the website. If you go on a growth focus website, you can still see my, uh, I believe my ad's still there in the in the sold section, so uh, you can take a look at this afterwards. But um, yeah, um, so they managed the, uh, I guess, the relationships and the introductions. So, and it was it was very well received. We had uh, forty inquiries, five or six uh, interviews, and all those people wanted different things, um, which was quite uh, was quite an eye opener as well, and had different feedback on the business as well. Uh, so we went through that process. And then uh, once we uh, once we verbally agreed to um, yeah which who we wanted to go through it was then a legal process and that legal uh, again the contracts done did take a little bit longer but at the end of the day like to go from um, to agreeing to proceed in like December fifteen and then settling on April fifteen so I mean four months and two months of that was the the legal process like uh, it was a pretty fast I was really surprised how quickly that it all happened so um uh yeah that was yeah, nice yeah so that, it, it, was, it was all through the brokers and um they had their, the networks the opportunities and uh and made sure that it wasn't just about the best price but make sure i had the good best fit for myself and my clients and that cultural fit as well so the business that you'd built up did, did you build that from zero did you you know buy any client bases along the way that some people do or, or it was all from scratch all from scratch. I yep. um, uh, coming from ANZ. Uh, one or two clients followed me. Uh, oh, two, a couple more insurance only clients followed me. But everything was through primary referral for, uh, referral partners and uh, social media marketing. Gotcha. Um, that's how we we're able to uh, grow the business to uh, uh, where it was. Yeah, nice. Yep. And so, and so, what's life like for you now? So you're you're an employed advisor working with your. <laughs> Same clients that you that you sold into the business. Are you still working with them? Like what what's life like for you now? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It it's um we yeah uh I've got the I'm in the privileged position where I can get to choose what I want to do next. And yeah, so I'm looking after my existing clients and uh, going to be doing a bit of marketing on the side as well, which is what I enjoy. So uh, just yeah, really to be able to just focus on the things that I enjoy. Uh, which is financial advice and doing a bit of marketing and not worrying not worrying about all the other stuff. Um, thankfully, I've given up the mortgage broking side of things. We've got a great guy, Shane, that looks after that. Thank heavens. 
Uh, cause that was two, three days a week. Don't have to manage staff. Don't have to do, um, all the yucky stuff. Um, look, I've got a good administration, uh, and power planning team with uh, Natasha and Mary that looks after me there. Um, yeah, it's just, just to be able to clear the headspace and just focus on what I enjoy doing is, um, uh, I, I'm really surprised how much I've enjoyed it and, yeah. uh, and how much I've really enjoyed, um, just being an advisor again. And like I said, I sold this with the intention of exiting at the end of the year, but, uh, I'm really, I'm the, the uh, Tyson and the new arrangements is definitely being acquired and appealing uh, to for me to stay on. So yeah, that's gotcha. what we're working through as a family as to what my our next moves will be and what that looks like, what's actually important, and what's not. But uh, yeah, I'm really loving just uh, the simplicity of being an advisor. I love being running my own business. Don't get me wrong; I absolutely loved what we built, and uh, and I was very successful. But I know what it takes to build a successful financial planning practice. It's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and long hours. And I just don't have that anymore at this present point yeah. in time. And I've got how easy it is to be an advisor when you've got an established book and you're not really fighting hard to bring in clients. Yeah. And and so what's um on on the you know, family front, the the home front, the outside of work. So it sounds like a a, a big driver of why you went down the selling the business route was to do with maybe more important things outside of work. Yeah. Uh, how, how's that? It might only be early days, but how's that playing out for you? It's very nice uh, to be able to walk away at five o'clock or six o'clock and uh, not have to turn on the computer again until the next day. Um, I don't have to do weekends. I don't have to do any nights. Um uh, to be able to fit it back into the proverbial nine to five has been good. And I, I'm still able to get some flexibility as well. Um, like one of the things that I do is I take my eldest daughter, Charlotte, to uh, Little Kickers, which is soccer training. You know, all these two-year-olds run around causing chaos. Like, yeah. So Thursday mornings, I'm not in the office till midday because that's something that's really important to me um, is to be able to take her and eventually Chelsea when she's old enough to uh, Little Kickers. So, um, yeah, so I've still got some flexibility and yeah, that's uh, which is good. And like I said, and still getting a, a salary as well. So uh, it's yep. all um, at the moment. It's all positives. I'm I haven't really come across any negatives so far. <laughs> so next bit that I wanted to tackle. There were some some questions from the ensemble, I guess, community. Um, before we move on to that, was there any anything else you wanted to add in the? I guess in the first half of our of our podcast around the sale yeah, and I mean- why and how. I think the main thing is like you've got options, and I think I think sometimes like I said I couldn't get over how simple the process was. Um, and you know, there was a lot of there's been a lot of talk about oh, you got to spend twelve months to get your book ready and all this kind of stuff. No, I, I didn't do any of that. Um, I've uh, you know like I said I went from having the idea to settlement within four months. Uh, so that's that's how it quickly can move. And also, don't assume what people want as well. I think that was one of the big eye-openers for me was that even though on paper the offers were, like the five or six people that we interviewed and put in offers were all virtually identical, they all wanted different things. Like some people wanted me to stay on. A couple of people made it clear they didn't want me to stay on. Some people uh, wanted to keep the Master Money Now brand. Some people didn't. Some people want to keep our offers. Some people did not. Um, those little nuances, um, really, they, you don't think of it at the time, but they do actually make a difference in the final, uh, the final offer. So, uh, yeah, I'm really, um, yeah, don't assume what people want. Even the fact that like my, my client base is definitely a a lower fee paying client base, which some people I've definitely seen commented think is a negative, but, um, as a couple pointed out, well, it means there's a lot of upside, and particularly with the millennial client base as well. I'm not sure if you could say the same about retiree base, but for a millennial client base, like there's plenty of upside um, as they grow their wealth and move into the future. Whereas a fully priced client base, you know, that are currently being charged eight, twelve, fifteen grand, whatever it might be, there's very little scope for them to go higher. Mm-hmm. So, like, like there's like there's so many different opinions. Like again, don't assume what you've built. Yeah, don't make unnecessary and negative assumptions about what your um uh, what your business is, uh, because there's someone out there that wants what you want, and um and yeah, and like I said, there's 
there's so many options out there and if you're able to take that you know take profit so to speak and um use that money to either invest and generate x amount of dollars or use it to buy we'll probably use ours to you know put a deposit on a family home we've been renting the last few years because that's the only option we could have done um, with a young family and be self-employed but you know and still have a job on the other side as well there's a lot of pros yes there's some negatives but on the whole there's a lot of pros for it and uh, I'm, i'd be very open i'll be very i would encourage people to at least have the conversation about what their options are because it surprised me what the options were and I think it would surprise a lot of people out there as well. You sound like a big advocate for it. So that kind of leads into the the first question from the from the ensemble community. So Andrea Jenkins yeah. asked, "What are the pros and cons of of going back to being an employee?" Mm. Uh, the pros, uh, I get. I guess it all depends where you go back and what you want to do. But certainly, the pros are obviously a guaranteed salary. That's good. Um, I did have that with Marcy Money now for the. Th- last couple of years but um uh it's good to get back to just a, a, a salary um especially being in a bigger team as well um to uh not have to do everything you know, it's been great to say oh oh that problem oh wait that's not my problem anymore i can pass it off to tyson or someone else so yeah. uh that's definitely been a good feeling the negatives again it depends where you go i guess the big one i think a lot of people have is that what i refer to loss of creative control but thankfully, Tyson has given me a lot of leash uh, to be able to and wants me to continue doing a few of the things I've been doing with and also incorporate that into Vista as well. So he really wants to take my strengths and put that into the business. So, But I acknowledge that for some people, that's not a consideration, especially if you're moving into a, a, an established business with well, uh, with processes, for example, in marketing in my case. So um, I mean, that would be one thing. Um yeah, I mean, and I know that's a big thing for some people, losing that creative control and having a boss and things like that. And dare I say it, having to uh, put down the ego, for lack of a better word, and um, and submit to someone else. Like, that's a big thing for a lot of people. So, um, to be able to not have to, one a pro is to not have to worry about making all the decisions uh, for me and where I'm at right now is a, is a really big thing for me yeah. and I'm a really big for me. Yep. Andrew Courtney had a couple of questions. The first one was, what valuation method uh, did you use and was the client base segmented in terms of that valuation? Uh, Can you talk through the valuation method? Yeah. So, I think the two valuation methods out there are still the recurring revenue and EBITDA. Um, uh, For me, EBITDA was not a, uh, got that acronym right. EBITDA wasn't the wasn't a good valuation for me, so we did buy recurring model. My client base wasn't segmented by fees; it was segmented by revenue type, so advisor service fees, insurance, and mortgage revenue. So there was slightly different, very slightly different uh, valuations on those three revenue streams. Yeah, but it wasn't segmented in terms of client value. Um, I think some may have tried, but they didn't get through to the interview stage. So. Uh, no, it was taken as a whole, um, just segmented by revenue type. Yeah. And uh, was there a second part to that question? Yeah. So he had, he had a so he had a second question. So you you answered both parts of the to the question. Oh, there. Cool, Thanks. Cool. But, but he did have a second question. Uh, and, and so what what is it about the business that you sold to that attracted to you to them most? So as you said, you had you know, f- yeah. five different interviews. What was it about the the you know, the final one that attracted you most? Yeah, uh, I think for, for me, Tyson, similar boat to where I was at. Um, he's two years older than me. He's got one child, um, and but also he grew up near Geelong, a place called Colac, which is about 30 minutes down the road. Yep. And I, I refer to it as country values. And I, I, I just felt we shared that, that as country values, the importance of looking after a client. We use the phrase shearing the sheep, not skinning it. Uh, you know, charge them fairly profitably but fairly and not overcharging clients and just having yeah and i think the team as well at vista a lot of them are in that in their 30 so a similar demographic yeah it was really a cultural fit that i felt that yep tyson for me was um very closely aligned to master your money now in terms of cultural very yep. different client base they're very much an established high net wealth predominantly retiree client based um, whereas obviously we're millennials, but from a cultural perspective, we felt that was by 
that was for me the biggest driver as a good fit. And like a couple of months in, my team has settled in very well with Vista and I think vice versa as well, um, which just reinforces that, yeah, culturally, I think is there was the, it was the key thing that, uh, that it's fitting. I'm not saying the other, other offers or people would, you know, bad people or anything ridiculous like that. Absolutely not. They had impressive businesses and, but just a culture that, uh, probably just didn't a hundred percent align with, uh, with, uh, what we've got with Vista here. So, um, yeah, like I said, it goes back to that point. Everything's a little bit different. And, and, and does Vista, I haven't looked up Vista's website. Does Vista have multiple advisors or is that a single kind of advisor business? No, no the so they've got, uh, Tyson and aged care specialist, Sonia, and an up-and-coming advisor called uh, Patrick, I hope it's Chip, or, or Crip. No, Patrick Chip, I'm pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Patrick. Um, but definitely remember that name. He's uh, he's 28 and on the rise. He's um, yep. He's got a phenomenal future ahead of him. Do you have a mentor in on a bit of social media and uh, advising stuff I'm really excited about? So yeah, we've nice. got three on that side, uh, plus a mortgage broker, and then we had myself and Socklay. Um, so now we'll have five advisors and one mortgage broker. Um so yeah, very very good team, yeah. um, and one that's we can yeah having conversations about scaling and so forth. Okay, uh, Adele Martin had a few questions for you, and, and you commented underneath her post saying other oh, bringing on the tough questions, but uh, I don't, oh, I don't think yes. they're, they're they're too tough. So we'll get into get into Adele's questions. So the first one that she asked was, would you do anything differently if you were starting again now? Yeah, I had I pondered that question a lot. Um, on a couple of different levels. Firstly, I definitely want to start it today. What I would, um, what I did five years ago, because the world has changed in the last five years. And as I said before, like in 2018 when I started, being an online advisor was a real competitive edge. Now it's below minimum standard. Uh, there was no advisors in the nursing space uh, when I started. Now there's there's a few more, four or five. Uh, I know Dell's done a little bit in that space. Uh, Grant Miller's another guy who I know does nurses uh, and quite a few more in that allied health professional space which generally encapsulate nurses so yeah you've got to be you've got to build a business that's right for the times and like I said when as I said before I was out of ideas as to what I think a practice should look like for the next five years I fully admit that so um, yeah I probably would do some things I would yeah start a probably different business to what I've got now if I was to start from scratch again. So, so do you mean working uh, got with a be... different type of client, do you mean? Potentially, yeah. yeah. Uh, potentially different clients, different ways of doing things. Um, I said, I'm not sure what that looks like, but yep. um, what was, again, what was an edge in 2018 is, well, in a lot of ways, below minimum standard yeah, in 2023. Yeah. So, you, yeah, that's why people like, again, Patrick, like I said before, who's got ideas and um, knows what the next generation wants, uh that's where um yeah what's what's going to take to grow the businesses over the next five years will be completely different to what the previous five years looked like so um yeah, fair enough. yeah uh, that's what i do different there um in terms of mastering money now i know again thought about adele's question a lot uh i did struggle with ideas but definitely two things firstly i should have niched much quicker it took me about two years to um to go down the nurse's path and i remember um uh, not listening to some very good wisdom, both inside and outside of the financial planning community about the importance of niching. I thought that would limit my audience, but uh, it definitely didn't. It opened up far more doors when people were like, oh, you're a ner- uh, advisor for nurses. It got opened up so much more doors than just being an advisor. Like even speaking to a referral partner, I'll be like, you know, I'm just a financial planner. I'm like, all right, I'm not sure which clients will s- we'll see what happens. Of course, nothing ever happened. The moment you say that you're a financial planner for nurses, clients are like, oh, I know a nurse. I'll send them straight to you that way. That gets your foot in the door. You do look after a couple of nurses. Then they're like, oh, do you look after teachers as well? Yep, yeah, great, fantastic. And that just opens the door that way. So definitely niching is uh, I'm a big advocate for now. After being a significant detractor five years ago, I was definitely wrong. You need to be niching. Yep. The second thing, and this sounds like a silly thing, but it's a really important one is that I would have got a separate work phone. Um, I think I've I've still got my personal phone here, which has got both, yeah, uh, my wife messaging me and my clients messaged me on the same phone at the same time. And that was a huge mistake. 
I needed to have a separate work phone. Because even now, like, and that's just a little thing, but even when I'm selling a business, like, if should I decide to leave, I've got to actually, you know, uh, can't take the phone with me. So uh, I've got to start from scratch there. So, uh, um, so I mean, that's that's a small thing, but it actually is a big thing. And also stops you from, because I know we're all at 9, 8, oh, 9 p.m. checking our phones uh, in front of the telly winding down. You want to have a set. You want to have a personal phone for that, not one that's got access to your work emails and work texts and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's a few things I would definitely do differently. What What were the best bits of being a solo owner? Was so what, what What did you yep. enjoy most, and what was the hardest? The part that I enjoyed the most was creative control. To be able to execute my ideas and have, I guess, leave my voice on uh, how I think advice should be. And uh, which was ultimately helping my mates with their finances, uh, a lot of which probably would have been not been serviced if uh, by most of the community, a financial plan community. Uh, that's the part that I really loved. I met so many great people, networked, had great opportunities. Some were fantastic, some were fantastic, and then weren't, and then some were just rubbish to, from day one. But it's been a hell. Of, it's been a roller coaster ride, um, and. You don't say you love every moment because there's a few moments, especially, you know, I'll go get the hardest part to skip that part. It's definitely letting go of staff. Um, yeah. We've had to do that a couple of times. That sucks. Um, particularly one or two of them were actually friends of mine um, as well. Having to let them go was, um, they were they were dark days. They were um, rough, yeah. They were rough, yeah. But when it comes to, you know, letting staff go or taking the whole business down with you, like that's, they the those sort of conversations are just yeah that's not cool so that's definitely the hard part and yeah but I mean like I said it's been a hell of a roller coaster and um, glad to be stepping off the roller coaster but thoroughly enjoy the experience I've got met again met so many people got so many stories to tell from it and so many opportunities that I would not have had I think if I was a PAY uh, PAYG employee only so yeah. Love my time, love what I did, but that season's over. I've got to accept that, uh, which is what I am doing counselling for, amongst other things. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, accept that uh, career and priority, a uh, career and long hours of the office are just no longer my priority anymore. Yeah. And would, yeah, Adele's final question was about taking on a business partner, but kind of tackled that uh, a little earlier yeah, in the conversation. Yeah. Uh, right. So thanks Adele for your for your few questions. Uh, Triona Thompson, hopefully I've pronounced your name correctly. Apologies if I haven't. Um, just an interesting question, which was, how did you negotiate your salary? So going from a, being a business owner, you would have paid yourself a salary, and hopefully there's some business profits. Okay. But um, yeah, as a as a PAYG employee, how did you negotiate your salary? Yeah, great question. Um, and again, I go back to my previous point that my intention was only to stay for six months and then leave so look i i i went a little bit low on my salary my salary right now uh is probably is a, a nominal salary uh which i'm totally okay with uh because i got a pretty good uh i've got a very good uh sale price for the business so i think that's the first one i made is don't try and be if you are getting a good price for the sale of your business don't don't go overs on your salary expectations especially during that responsibility period, which for me is 12 months. Um, uh, Taking a step back, usually it's either 12 months or 24 months, you get your first payment, the next payment in 12 months, depends what left of the business and so forth. Uh, sometimes it's 24 months for some people. So um, yeah, so for the first 12 months for me, my salary would be probably be a little bit low the mar- what the market's paying. And yep. I'm totally okay with that uh, because again, I've got a very good uh, payment and I didn't want to put that payment at risk just to get an extra, you know, t- tens of th- uh, ten, ten thousand, yeah, whatever, ten twenty grand salary. Yeah, to, uh, yeah, exactly. To get the salary. So, um, and again, what does that look like in twenty twenty four? On the assumption I stay under Vista, which is looking more likely. That's uh, that's a conversation I'm having with Tyson, of course, but also my family as well. And tossing up, for example, well, do I ask for a full time salary or do I go back and say, hey, I only want four days a week, therefore I'm only going to take a lower salary yeah. um i know if i were a full uh, extreme example 300k salary I'm not asking for that tyson don't worry but you know i've got to bring in, uh, probably a million dollars worth of client revenue every year like to do that you need 
60 hours a week to do that. Is that the right thing for my family right now? It's probably not. So I'm probably going to be in a season where, yeah, I will be at this stage probably thinking that I'll take a lower salary just so I can have a bit more work-life balance. But I, everyone's in a different position. And, um, and that's something I think that's going to change over time too. Like you're, you know, you're, happen, you're, yeah. you're, you're wanting to spend time with your kids whilst they're really young. They'll start school. They'll eventually finish school. Like you know, you're yep. only in your thirties, so that, you know there's a there's a bit of plenty of time ahead of you, and that can change yep. over time. Are you speaking more experienced? Because how old are your kids, James? Uh, nine and nearly six. So grade four nine and grade six. prep. So yeah. So you're yeah about five ten year uh, five eight years ahead of me. So I mean, yeah. uh, I have heard they're a bit easier at that age. So. Uh, um, yeah, maybe at that time I'll go back to full time asking and doing those longer hours to get the higher wage. So I had another question for you. This this wasn't one that was in the uh, in that community post there. Um, um, yeah, but it's something I thought of as as we've been as we've been speaking. Uh, how did you tell your clients about you selling the business and and how did they take it? Yeah, so we did a we sent out a video to them where I explained the reasons why I sold the business and. I think because it's a millennial client base, um, uh, they were much more, they were very understanding of, uh, of you know, where I'm at and things like that. They were definitely very reassured that I'm staying for the rest of the year. Uh, I think that's a big one as well. I think it might have been quite different if I said 90 days I'm leaving goodbye. Yeah. So I'm glad I've, um, I'm staying with someone that wanted me to uh, stay long term. So, and maybe taking a step back for those who are thinking of selling their business, don't wait until the last moment when you're done, you don't want to do advice anymore to sell it. You need to give yourself a year or two. Uh, We've got a year or two of energy left before selling so you can do that transition as smoothly as possible. So, But yeah, we did a video out and like I said, once the clients understood that, yeah, I'm staying around for the rest of the year and at this stage looking likely I'll stay on, um, ultimately for them and, and also that their fees are not going to change as well, that definitely came up a few times. Uh, they were pretty happy to – ultimately for them, it was just a name change. Yeah. And, yeah, they were pretty comfortable with that. So, um, happy days. Yeah. And do you think so, – so, I've had a, a few conversations with other people uh, uh, around is it is it really tough to be a to, – to just be a solo advisor running your own business? Do, do you think the world that we operate in now in financial advice makes that difficult to be on your own? That There is a bit of a – safety and numbers kind of element to the world that we live in at the moment or do you think it's still doable on your own it's doable until things go wrong yeah and that's um our look we all uh, well, i'm not sure exactly if you start as a solo operator james but i think a lot of people started as solo operators i've got no issue starting there or being there but i don't think you want to finish there yeah uh, and like for me we, we had a second advisor. We've had mortgage brokers on and off. So we had a bit of team when, when that was going well. That was really good for me. But um, yeah, we didn't get that final push to be able to keep that consistently and have more than myself and one other advisor. So um, I think that's going to be a big shift over the next five years, that, uh, especially as licensee fees go and PI and all that kind of stuff gets higher and higher and higher. We're going to see more consolidation in the industry that's probably if i get my crystal ball out i think that's going to be one of the big changes so yeah i do think that we will be yeah having these conversations more and more and also as the economy tightens up as well and there's potentially for certain segments uh less opportunities to obtain clients as well but um yeah i i do think that you need to have a plan to either scale up quickly so it's not just you or it's um or you've got a plan to yeah merge with someone else. Um, because again, going back to the car crash that I had, like at the end of the day, like and one big reason, the thing that always played in my mind is that if I, heaven forbid, died in that car crash or was TPD or whatever, there would have been no one that would have had either both the skill sets and the motivation to be able to sell the business. My wife wouldn't have a clue. Yeah, um, yeah. the staff wouldn't know what to do. The licensee would have helped a little bit, but um, ultimately, like yeah, if if ever be things go wrong, like like I've got yeah, I, my family would have walked away with nothing. But now they will have you know uh, a very significant lump sum that's going to set up 
our, my wife and I's future, my kids' future, and potentially my children's children as well. So mm. uh, that real motivator to, you know, to, that was a real motivator to sell the business because what they say, a bird in the hand is worth much more than two in the bush. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the um, just by the questions and the engagement that you're post and you only put it up a few days ago in on, on ensemble there that uh, you know the number of people that you know, either asked questions or commented saying they're looking forward to the episode um I just yeah is, is a sense check on whether whether you're a business on the acquiring side or if you're a, a solo operator on the on the selling side there's a lot of interest in this topic at the moment so uh definitely, definitely. thank you for putting your hand up to be to be part of it and uh, joining me on the podcast. Was there any any final comments or anything uh, extra that you want to add as we as we kind of round out the episode today? Yeah, I'll just give a very quick shout out, and I promised I would because I spoke to him before. But my uh, legal uh, person, uh, William Atto, Legal Made Easy, uh, definitely recommend him. He was fantastic throughout the process. the The legal process is a um, it's a it's a tough process uh, because it does. Sadly, makes you think the worst of everyone. Um, it's, uh, yeah, not fun, but Will made that process so easy. So I promised him a shout out. So I've just quickly squeezed that one in. But again, like I said before, um, yeah, as I was actually, as I said in my, um, when I did my roadshow tour for the AFA back in 2020, just before COVID, ironically, um, no one, no one got to their best deathbed and wanted and regretted not spending more time at the office. They mm. wanted to spend more time with their family. They want to spend more time with their kids. They want to spend more time with themselves. And whilst I absolutely believe in, yeah, you know, we're professionals, we work hard and we get fantastically rewarded for that. We are ultimately humans as well. And uh, and particularly, you know, I've been open about my struggles with mental health. And I said, I'm looking forward to this year. One of my goals is actually to get my head right and do the work and spend time with, um, with professionals and non-professionals to work on uh, some of the things that I'm working through, both related to the sale and unrelated to the sale. Um, you've got to you've got to look after yourself first because uh, a good you, how it can it's a better advisor, a better spouse, a better parent. Um, you've got to look after you first. And there's nothing wrong with accepting if you are in a similar position to me, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying, I'm I've hit my limit and I just can't do it anymore. It's, I'm, you'd much rather you have that conversation and take the six months or whatever it is that it takes, four to six months it takes to sell your business rather than just ignore the signs, ignore the limits and everything just crash and burns. Yep. Um, and you are in a market where you've got so many options. So look after yourself, have a chat to myself or um, Growth Focus or plenty of other brokers or and Somnol is a great financial planning community. And again, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, we've the financial planning community is a real camaraderie, is a real family feel. And the amount of information that I have gained from advisors, I've, I've been in the industry now 12 years, the amount of information that have been given me from advisors has been phenomenal for me. So to have this opportunity to be able to give back a little bit to the uh, financial planning community is phenomenal. So thank you again, James, for the opportunity. Thank you to Insomnial. As well for the opportunity. Thank you everyone for the questions, and uh, hopefully it gives you food for thought uh, about your options. And um, and yeah, I hope you do what's best for yourselves, your families, and your members as well. Wish you all the best. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for joining me. So if anyone wants to reach out to Chris, he's on uh, the Ensemble platform. There you can find him, or on LinkedIn, Instagram as well. You'll be able to find him. We'll put some links to different places in the show notes. But Chris, thanks again for joining me. Uh, really great chat. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, James.